Okay, now we're going to talk about chapter five. In chapter five, uh, specifically on the eukaryotic cells and microorganisms. <clears throat> so what we can do is when we look at um, eukaryotes and the history of them, well, they first appeared about two billion years ago. We can tell this because of evolutionary um, fossils, etc. right? And so evidence suggests that evolution from the prokaryotic organisms developed by symbiosis or things living together where they help each other out. So like a parasite would be something takes over the body and it's at a detriment to the host, where a symbiotic relationship would be they're actually working together um, to make it work, right? Then organelles originated from prokaryotic cells um, that became trapped inside of them. So you can um, look at the diagram. So some of these ancient eukaryotic cells were found. Okay, I think it said back in China in um, your book. And so you can see that looking at the ancient ones, they do have organelles, right? The little chloroplasts, the cell walls, et cetera. So these are very, very, very old eukaryotic cells that we have been able to study. So looking at eukaryotic microbes, um, the ones that are always unicellular are gonna be your protozoans where you have fungi and algae, and these can be unicellular or multicellular, depending on which type of subspecies it is. And then you have your multicellulars um, that um, are going to be multi, multiple cells except for in the reproductive stages. What they mean by that is like an egg, an egg is only one, right? But then when it <clears throat> forms a zygote by joining with a sperm, it's an organism. And so some examples of this would be like your uh, hel helminths, and these are your animals with the unicellular eggs or uh, the larval forms. <clears throat> so here is a, a picture of the eukaryotic cell. And I mean, the big thing to remember is that the nucleus is going to be encased in a little nuclear envelope. And then we have those little baby organs, otherwise called, called organelles in them. And these are going to be subspecialized for different functions throughout the, uh, the cell and therefore the body. So when we look at the organization of the eukaryotic cell, you can see that we have um, some external organelles and other structures, which would be your appendages, like flagella and cilia, or the glycocalyx, which would be like your capsules and slimes. You can have the boundaries of the cells, which would be like the cell wall or the cell membrane. Then you can have the internal, internal organelles, um, which are going to be those specialized organs that we probably pay more attention to. So looking into the subset of external structures and specifically looking at the flagella, um, this is going to be a locomotor appendage. So locomotor is just a fancy word for it, but it helps you move. Okay. And so your flagella is going to be a long sheath cylinder, cylinder, which is going to contain microtubules in a nine to two arrangement. These are going to be uh, covered by an extension of the cell membrane, and these are 10 times thicker than a prokaryotic flagella, and they function in motility. So you can see that, um, you know, where they're, they're affixed, right, and then that it's going to whip back and forth and push in, a, in it in a snake-like fashion, and it can also twiddle <laughs> and lash, right, so there's different movements that a flagella can make. Um, the difference between flagella and cilia, well, these are similar in overall structure, but they are shorter and more numerous. So they're found only on a single group of the protozoan and a certain amount of animal cells, and they're going to function in motility, feeding, and filtering. The glycocalyx, this is the outermost boundary that comes into uh, direct contact with the environment, and this is usually composed of polysaccharides. And it appears as a network of fibers, a slime layer, or a capsule. And this functions in adherence and um, protection and signal reception. And beneath the glycocalyx are going to be fungi and most algae, algae, which have a thick, rigid cell wall, as well as protozoas, uh, a few algae, and these all, and animal cells, which lack a cell wall and therefore only have a cell membrane. So specifically talking about the cell wall, um, this is like the main boundary, right? So this is going to be rigid and it provides a structural support and shape. And the fungi have a thick inner layer of polysaccharide fibers that is composed of um, chelitin or cellulose um, is with a thin layer of mixed glycans. 
Then you have um, algae, and these are going to be variable in their chemical composition. And the substances are commonly found in cellulose, like pectin, mannans, silicon dioxide, and calcium carbonate. Um, specifically talking about the cytoplasmic cell membrane, um, this is a typical bilayer of phospholipids and proteins. So we talk a lot about in like AMP, even in just basic biology, about the phospholipid bilayer. And so it's two layers of phospholipids that make up this cell membrane. And uh, sterols, specifically cholesterol, is going to also help with the stability as well as the flexibility so that as I run into the wall, I'm not breaking and shattering my cell walls. And these serve as selective permeable barriers in the transport and also eukaryotic cells can contain membrane-bound organelles that account for 60 to 80 percent of their volume. We will spend a lot of time uh, and um, effort on the nucleus because this is where we have all of our cellular DNA, right? So the compact, the nucleus is a contact, compact sphere or circle and this is the most prominent organelle in a eukaryotic cell. The nuclear envelope is composed of two parallel membranes that are separated by a narrow space and it's perforated with pores. And this is going to contain your chromosomes or your DNA material, right? And then the nucleolus is going to be a small little area inside the nucleus. And this is where the RNA is made and the ribosomes are assembled. So why do we care? Well, this is where we can really see our DNA and how it can be packaged different and do different things during mitosis, which is the, um, the copying of the body cells, right? So mitosis is your toes, right? So your body cells where meiosis are gonna be your sex cells, which would be your eggs and sperm. So the different phases are gonna be interphase, prophase, early metaphase, metaphase, anaphase, anaphase, early telophase, telophase, and then um, when they actually have the cleavage burrow that is fully formed and they will separate into two daughter cells. And so, um, it, you know, it is important to understand what's happening in each of these different cells, you know, where the interphase is, you know, it's a resting state. And then the prophase, they're starting to get lined up. Metaphase, they are lined up. Anaphase, they're starting to split, right? Telophase is they're going back towards the telomeres. So, um, you know, those are the nuclear changes that are going to be occurring during mitosis. So um, endoplasmic reticulum, this is another organelle that's important, and there are two different types. There's the rough ER and then the smooth ER, okay? So the rough endoplasmic reticulum, or the rough ER, this originates from the outer membrane of the nuclear envelope, and it extends into a continuous network through the cytoplasm, and this is rough due to the presence of ribosomes, and these are proteins that are specific for making and um, making proteins, right? And so the proteins are going to be made and shunted into the endoplasmic reticulum for packaging and transport. And this is the first step in the secretory pathway. Then the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, this is a closed tubular ne uh, network without ribosomes. So that's why it's smooth to the, um, to the naked eye, right? Or to the eye under the microscope. And this functions in nutrient processing, uh, synthesis, and storage of lipids. So here is an Upton personal view of the rough ER. So you can have that you have those polyribosomes, which are the little dots, and those are going to be making the ribosomal surface, right? So you have the small subunit, large subunit, the ribosome itself, where the messenger RNA is going to go through and get um, made, and then um, the protein is being synthesized. So we're actually reading the messenger RNA off to make our polypeptide chain, which is going to be our amino acids, okay? Um, so the Golgi apparatus, this is going to modify, store, and package proteins, and this consists of a stack of flattened sacs that are called cisternae, okay, or cisterns. Um, cisternae would be what, plural, and then a cistern is singular. Um, so then moving through with the transport processes, we have transitional uh, vesicles from the endoplasmic reticulum that are going to contain those proteins. And those are going to go to the Golgi apparatus for the modification and maturation of those proteins. So condensing these vesicle uh, transport proteins to organelles or to secretory proteins um, to the outside. So this is basically how we're getting information from the inside of the cell out um, to the outside of the cell to where it needs to have or be secreted so that we can actually do the functions that they need to do. So your pathway here is going to be the nucleus to the rough endoplasmic reticulum 
to the Golgi apparatus, to the vesicles, and then they're going to get secreted out by exocytosis outside of the cell. Okay, so the nucleus, uh, the ribosomal parts, right, the Golgi, and then it's going to get expelled. More internal structures are going to be like your lysosomes, and these are vesicles that contain enzymes that originate from the Golgi apparatus. And these are involved in intracellular digestion of food particles, particles and protection against invading microbes. So they're very, very important. To lyse means to break apart. So a lysosome is just a vesicle that can digest things, okay? Or lyse, break apart things. Our vacuoles, these are membrane-bound sacs that contain particles to be digested, excreted, or stored. I kind of think of it as a vacuum, right? We sucked it up, and now they're just, like, storing there. And then the phagosome, um, this is a vacuole that's merged with a lysosome, so I think of those kind of like Pac-Mans. They're going to be like phages, like, and they're going to go in and they're going to eat and digest. Um, mitochondria, powerhouse of the cell. We talk a lot about the mitochondria. Um, so this functions in energy production. This consists of an outer membrane and an inner membrane with folds that are called cristae. Cristae are going to hold the enzymes and the electron carriers of the aerobic respiration. They're also going to divide independently of the cell, and they contain DNA and prokaryotic ribosomes. Okay, so ribo uh, mitochondria are very, very important. That's where we make the majority of our ATP in aerobic metabolism. Um, chloroplasts, these would be specialized cells, right? So we don't have them because we don't do photosynthesis, but chloroplasts are going to convert the energy of the sunlight into chemical energy through the process of photosynthesis. And these are going to be found in algae and plant cells, not in JANX cells, right? Um, outer membrane covers and inner membranes are folded into sacs, and these are called velcoloids, and these are stacked into granula, which you can see in that image right there. And these are the primary producers of organic nutrients for other organisms. So when I eat a nice kale salad or a spinach salad, I am enjoying these nice chloroplastic nutrients, right? Um, our ribosomes, again, these are going to be composed of R RNA, ribosomal RNA, as well as proteins. Okay, and these are going to be scattered in the cytoplasm or associated with the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And these are larger than the prokaryotic ribosomes, but they do also function in protein synthesis. So these guys are the workers of the body. Okay. Um, moving on then to internal structures, the cytoskeleton. This is kind of like the scaffolding, right, that keeps the cell together. So this is a flexible framework of proteins, microfilaments, and microtubules that form a network through the cytoplasm. And this is involved in movement of the cytoplasm, um, the amoeboid move movement, transport, and structural support. So as you can see, like in these, this picture, right, the microtubules are the little red guys. They, it really does look like a, a, a scaffolding, right? If you've ever gone to or driven by a construction site, the scaffolding is what's there to support things. And that's what the cytoskeleton is. So here's a nice little table comparing uh, your prokaryotic, eukaryotic, and viral cells. Um, so you can see, you know, the genetics, the reproduction of them, the biosynthesis, et cetera, and how size um, is affected between prokaryotic, eukaryotic, and viruses. So you can see that eukaryotic cells are typically larger, viruses are the smallest, and then prokaryotic cells are there in the middle. Um, the phylogenetic relationships between eukaryotic cells. Um, so, well, this one is uh, based on messenger RNA analysis. You have amoeboids, fungi, right? So you can go through, and this is going to be the evolutionary advancement of the eukaryotic cells. So this would be the unicellular um, ancestor. And then as we go farther up this um, arrow, we're going to be more distinguished and more evolved. And um, so these are going to be the more, um, like the more complicated cells, right? And then you can see the eukaryotic um, branch here and how it all funnels down into one. Okay. So looking at the survey of eukaryotic microbes, we're going to specifically be focusing on fungi, algae, protozoan, and parasitic forms. So in the kingdom fungi, there are 100,000 species that are divided into two different groups macroscopic fungi and microscopic. So if you, again, look for those root words, macro is large, micro is small. So macroscopic kind of makes sense that you can see them with your naked eye, right? They're big. And these would be like your mushrooms, your puff balls, and your gill fungi, where your microscopic are going to be like your molds and yeast, kind of like we did in um, 
in the lab last week, we actually got to see some bread molds and other things like that, right? Um, and the majority of fungi are unicellular or colonial, and few actually have cellular specialization. Um, with fungi, these are existing in two morphologies, and morphology is shapes, right? So the more, like how their morphology is, what they're shaped like. And yeast are going to be uh, round ovals, and they have asexual reproduction, where hyphae, these are going to be the long filamentous fungus, or fungi or molds, okay? So we have two shapes, circles or rods pretty much, right? So some exist in other forms, which would be dimorphic, di meaning two or multiple. And so these would be characteristic of some, some pathogenic molds. Okay. Um, so how do fungi stay alive? Well, all of them are heterotrophic. The majority of them are har uh, harmless. They are harmless saprobes that are living off of dead plants and animals. Some can be parasitic, and these would be living on the tissues or other organisms, but none of them are obligate. Um, and like one subset would be mycoses, and these would be like the fungal infections that you see like on your feet, you know, um, and these are extremely widespread distribution in many habitats. I know that, you know, if uh, some of our armed forces go to like Vietnam or, you know, tropical areas, they have what is it, swamp feet, and that would be from this, from like a fungal nutrition uh, or a fungal infection problem. So um, for the organization of fungi, we have yeast, and these would be our soft, uniform texture and appearance, and these would re reproduce through asexual processes, which is called budding. So basically, it just says, hey, we want to make a new copy. Uh, it kind of poops out a little bud, uh, bud, and then it continues to develop, and it squeezes it off, and you have your um, new cell. Okay, so that's called budding, right? Um, fungal organization, this is where we have our filamentous fungi, and these are masses of hyphae that are called mycelium, and these would be cottony, hairy, or velvetine in texture, and the hyphae may be divided by cro um, cross walls, and these would be like basically separate, right? You have vegetative hyphae, and these would be digesting and absorbing the nutrients, and you also have reproductive hyphae, and these are going to be the ones that are going to be producing spores for reproduction, okay? So you can see that in penicillin, we're going to have septum with pores, right? And we have separate hyphae, where in the, the rhizopsis, we have the nuclei and the non-separate hyphae. Okay. So how do fungi reproduce? Well, primarily it's through spores that are formed on reproductive hyphae. We have asexual reproduction, and these are forms... Um, these are spores that are formed throughout the budding or through mitosis, and this an example of that would be canidia or sporangias of spores. Okay, so you can either have your vegetative hyphae, your reproductive hyphae, and like how it's germinating, or you can have spores that go poof, right, and go to the next. Um, types of asexual molds, mold spores. Ouch, I just hurt my elbow. Sorry. Um, you have sporangial spores. Okay, and you have your canidia. So you can see that these guys are kind of just big spores. Um, they're like bigger, where the other ones are kind of smaller little um, packets, right, or pockets. Um, for your sexual reproduction, the spores are formed following the fusion of two different strains and the formation of a sexual structure. Um, these would be like zygospores, uh, cytospores, and basidospores. Uh, you also have sexual spores and spore forming structures that are um, one basis for classifications. Looking at bread mold, I know we looked, some of us looked at bread mold in lab last week and that was pretty cool. Um, but you could have your positive strain, negative strain, your sex, uh, sexual phases where you have your zygote, your mature zygospore, your germinating zygospore, and then it releases their little germs and then they can keep going and reproducing, etc. You also have the production of um, acidospores. This would be where you have your fruiting body and you have um, the zygote nuclei that undergo meiosis prior to the formation of those SI, and then they release the acidospores. Okay. You have the male and female, um, hypha and um, hypha. So what happens in a mushroom? Well, we have um, the soil and you're gonna have a fertilized spore and you're gonna have a button and then it starts to continue to grow 
and then it, it matures into where it has a cap and a gill, the stalk, the annulus, and then a portion of the gill is going to be covered with those bacidia, and then they fuse to form a diploid nucleus, diploid meaning two, nucleus is the part where the um, DNA is, right? And then the diploid nucleus undergoes meiosis to produce four haploid nuclei, and then these are going to be what's re, um, released into the atmosphere. So fungal classifications. Um, the kingdom you me you might hold on that I can't talk today. I'm sorry. Um, you mycota is subdivided into several phyla, which is based upon the typical type of sexual reproduction. You have the zygomycota, and these would be your zygospores, which are mostly sporangiospores and some canidia. You have your ascomycota, and this would be your ascospores or your canidia. You have your basidiomycota. And these would be your basidiospores or canidia. You have your um, cryptomycota, and these would be your flagellate, uh, flagellated spores. Then you have fungi that can only produce asexual spores, and these are called imperfect. So here is a picture of your diverse um, different forms of fungi, and we will also see this um, in lab when we actually get to look at the slides of the different fungi. Right? So how do we or we identify fungi? Well, we're going to use a specific media to help us to isolate them. So then we're going to look at macroscopic and microscopic observation of the asexual spore, spore forming structures and spores, the hyphae type, the colony texture and pigmentation, and then the physiologic characteristics as well as the genetic makeup. So why do we care and why do we even have fungi around? Well, they can have beneficial as well as adverse impacts on us. So some of the adverse impacts would be like mycoses, allergies, toxic productions, et cetera. And also destructions of crops and food storages. Here in Michigan, we have a ton of corn, right? So corn molds and fungi can destroy a whole crop. But sometimes they can be beneficial as well because they help to decompose dead plants and animals. And they also can help us make um, and grow sources of antibiotics, alcohol, and organic acids, as uh, well as vitamins. And these can be used in making foods and also in genetic studies because they're easily manipulated. Okay, so here are is a fun little table of, well, I don't know if fun, fun's the right word, but uh, these are major fungal infections of the humans um, and the degree of tissue, the name of the infection, and the causative fungus. So that's good, and that would be great to um, add to your slide deck, right? All right, moving on to protists. We have algae and protozoa. And algae are the eukaryotic organisms that are usually unicellular or one-celled, and they're colonial. These are going to photosynthesize with chlorophyll A. So algae do photosynthesis. They can make their own food using sunlight. Protozoa, these are unicellular eukaryotes that um, lack tissues, and they share similarities in cell structure, nutrition, the life cycle, as well as in biochemical background. So looking specifically at algae, they are, again, photosynthetic organisms. So they are microscopic forms that are unicellular, colonial, and filamentous. There are macroscopic forms that are colonial and multicellular, and these contain chloroplasts with chlorophyll and other pigments. They also have a cell wall, and they may or may not have a flagella. Most are free-living in fresh and marine water, and these are called plankton. And these provide the basis of the food web in most aquatic habitats, and they also provide a large proportion of the atmospheric oxygen. Dianoflagellates can also cause the red tides that you can sometimes um, see or hear about, right? And they give off toxins that can cause food poisonings uh, with neurologic symptoms that are no fun. I've had food poisoning before. So algae classification, this would be classified according to the types and pigments of the cell wall. Then these, again, multifactorial uses. They can be used for cosmetics, food, medicinal products, etc. And so here would be the group, the organization, if we have a cell wall or not, any colors that they have, and then why we care. Okay, so red tide, uh, emulsifier, source of agar, and a food additive, precursor to higher plants, right? So a lot of these diatomaceous earth. This one is what I was telling some of you guys about in lab, right? When you are brushing your teeth in that crunch, that can come from this diatomaceous earth. So they can use silicon dioxide, right? They can use those in toothpaste, and that's why you get the crunch um, after you brush your chompers. 
Protozoan, uh, these are a diverse group of 65,000 species, and they vary in shape, but they lack a cell wall. Most are unicellular, and colonies are rare. Most are harmless, free-living, um, and they live in a moist habitat where some are, um, are animal parasites, and they can be spread by insect vectors. They are heterotrophic, and they lack chloroplasts. And these also have the cytoplasm that's going to be divided into ectoplasm, or outside, as well as endoplasm, or inside. And this is fed by engulfing um, microbes or other organic matter. They, uh, most of them have a way to move. And so these would be your locomotor structures, such as flagella, cilia, or pseudopods. And these exist as tropozoites, which are modal feeding stages. And many can enter into a dormant resting stage when the conditions are unfavorable for growth and feeding. And this would be like um, when they form a cyst, right? Um, all can reproduce asexually through mitosis or through multiple fissions, and many can also reproduce sexually through uh, conjugation, right, and joining together. How do we identify our different protozoans? Well, we can classify them. Um, it's kind of hard, right, because they're so diverse. But they are simple, uh, they're a simple grouping can be performed and it's based on a methodology of how they move, how they reproduce in their life cycle. So the mastigophoria, these are primarily flagellar motility and some are flagellal, some are amoeboid, but they reproduce by sexual reproduction. You have your sarcodenia and these are primarily, amoe primarily amoebos and they are asexually reproducing by fission and most are free living cells. We have your cilia phoria, and these are cilia, where we have trophozoites and cysts, and most are free living and harmless as well. And then you have the apicomplexia. <laughs> My brain's like so fried today, I'm sorry guys. Um, and this is where the motility is absent, except for in the male sex cells or the male gametes. Um, they have sexual as well as asexual reproductions, as well as a complex life cycle, and these are all parasitic, which kind of makes sense when they're, um, they can't move, <laughs> right? They're going to have to take over a host, growing pens in your host organism to kind of take care of most of their functions in life, right? So here is a picture of one of the mastigophorias. You can see uh, he has one flagellum, we have the nucleosomes, right, or the organelles, sorry, and they have the nucleosomes, nucleus inside the nuclei, right, central, so it's a more developed cells. The sarcodenia, this one kind of looks like a glob. Uh, it still has some of the higher organization, but definitely not as much as the other one. Uh, Cilophoria, these have a ton of little cilli, right, and that's how they would move. The apical complexia, um, you have your food vacuoles, your nucleus, your cytosome, etc. Um, here is your fun little table of pathogenic protozoa. And these would be the disease, the source, and why we would care. So that's a great little summary table. Um, and then we have important protozoan pathogens. And these are kind of like, why, why do we care? Well, um, some of the pathogenic flagellates would be um, the tryptosomes, and these would be like T. brucei, which is an African sleeping sickness, or T. cruzi, which is uh, Chagas disease, and this is prevalent in South America. But you can see that you would have, uh, um, this is a stay in human dr uh, drilling. So we have a cat, I have my cat Sophie, she's upstairs hiding, right? But it can go, they can get on us, and then they can get transported, right? And this is how we can get them from Apparently armadillos and possums, and your cat gets them, and then we get them, and the life cycle continues. Um, some infectious amoeba. This would be Entamoeba histolichia, which is uh, amoebic dysentery, and dysentery is um, can be getting, can be gotten worldwide. What about parasitic hemolyphs? Well, these are multicellular animals and they have organs for reproduction, digestion, movement, and protections. We also have parasitic, parasitic host tiss tissues and they have mouth parts for attachment or to digest the host tissues. 
Okay, most have well-developed sex organs that produce eggs and sperm, and they uh, then the fertilized eggs go through the larval period in or out of our host body. Um, some major groups of parasitic hemoliths, well, flatworms would be one. These are flat. They have no definite body cavity. They have a digestive tract um, that has a blind pouch, and they have a very simple excretory and nervous systems. Um, some examples of these would be tapeworms or flukes, and these are flattened, non-segmented worms with sucking mouth parts. You also have roundworms, which would be like nematodes, and these are round. They have a complete digestive tract. They have a protective surface uh, cuticle, and they have spines and hooks on the mouth. They also have excretory and nervous systems that are poorly developed. Um, how do we classify and identify? Well, we classify these according to shape, size, and organ development. Also, the presence of hooks, suckers, and other special structures, the mode of reproduction, hosts, and appearance of eggs and larvae. And also, we can identify them by microscopic detection of the worms, the larvae, or the eggs. A couple, two more slides. The distribution and importance of parasitic worms. Well, approximately 50 species of parasitize humans. Okay, so that means 50 species of parasites can infect humans. And these are distributed worldwide. And some are restricted to certain geographical regions with a higher incidence in the tropics. But that's just because we don't have the climate or the nutrients to necessarily support them, like for instance here in Michigan. Um, they can be acquired through ingestion of a larvae or egg in fool, food or from soil or water. And some are carried by insect vectors. And these can affect billions of humans. So we have to be kind of careful about them. Okay. And so pinworm is uh, an example of another one that, I mean, I know that we talked about it in the lab a little bit, um, where there it's very easy to transport. Okay. So you can get it and then <laughs> pick your nose. <laughs> right. And then the egg can get cross-contaminated and uh, you know, passed on to a child because a lot of them times they're playing with their mouth or their nose and hands and all this stuff. Okay, so that is your overview of eukaryotic cells for this week. We'll see you guys in the lecture.